know what it's like and how we should be single in Christ as well. Uh, the men's luncheon is going to be March 21st, and that's at Sam Bright's house. Um, Way of the Master. Uh, Way of the Master is an evangelism course that's done by Living Waters Ministry, but Brian Fonten of uh, so- Foot Soldiers for Christ is going to be coming here and actually putting it on for us. So if you've ever wanted to just get better at, at witnessing, if you want to go street witnessing with us, if you want to, you know, just kind of, you know, learn these methods, it's going to be a two-day class, uh, and that's March 27th and 28th, and it's about, um, overall, I want to say it's eight or ten hours, so uh, we'll, we'll probably do like um, two to four hours on, our, on that Friday the 27th, and uh, then another six hours on the 28th, and then we'll actually go street witnessing right after. So uh, remember that next Saturday to spring forward, right? Yay! Spring forward. Yay! So most of your phones will do it automatically for you, but uh, just a reminder, um, because, you know, you'll be an hour late to everything, um, and for our military friends, that can end up being very bad for you, All right? So uh, um, we'll just kind of put that out there, um, and don't depend on your phone to change, you know? Like, uh, you know, these electronics, the devil. Um, <laughs> yes, tis, tis. And it is next Saturday, right? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The joy of it. Uh, okay, so... Um, is there anything else we need to announce? Anything? Anybody? Anybody? Yes. There is a sign-up sheet in the back for the marriage conference. Yes, sir. Yeah, we got to have a head count because we got to know, um, you know, huh? What? Say something. Sit. Why don't you guys greet one another in the name of the Lord? So, but still, he said it. If I've already given you one, just give one to somebody else. There you go. All right. So, you got a free pen. They send us pens all the time that have, like, the church name on them and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, just give it to somebody. So, um, they're just trying to get us to buy a whole bunch more. So, uh, let's see. As you're turning to Mark chapter 13... Uh, I also want to remind you, we've got the information sheets for Regalo de Amor, the mission trip stuff. Um, the, the information sheets are on the back as well, right beside the sign-ups for the marriage conference. So let's pray for the message. Uh, Father, we come before you right now, Lord Jesus, and uh, just lift up this time to you, lift up this word to you. As we begin to examine this, Lord, help us to see... Uh, not to come with any presuppositions, not to come with any, um, any baggage, any thought, anything. Just come into this and examining the text alone. Um, not what people have written in the past, not even what people say now, but what your word says. And as we examine these things, Lord, I just pray right now, Lord, in Jesus' name, um, that you would help us to remember that as heavy as this text is, as heavy as the things we are examining are, that, Lord, uh, you don't tell it to us to make us feel bad or for us to uh, react in shock, but, Lord, that we might rejoice um, because we know your redemption draws nigh. Not just your redemption of us that you've accomplished in Jesus Christ, but that you've, you will accomplish in this entire universe as you hit that reset button. 
And uh, Lord, we just uh, lift up this time to you. Pray for this message, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And, and I come to it kind of heavy because it's like, um, you know, when Jesus is coming up to Jerusalem, we know the shortest, oh, uh, we, we, we know the shortest, the shortest scripture in, in the Bible, you know, at least in the English version, is Jesus wept. And, and we read that and we see that Jesus is weeping over what's going to happen to Israel, over the rejection of Israel, um, over the rejection of the leaders that we saw all through Mark chapter 12. Um, and now, you know, I, I just want you to get this. What Jesus is doing here in Mark chapter 13 is he's not, you know, trying to depress everybody and he's not trying to, these guys ask him a question and he responds to it and he's pulling this curtain back, which is the apocalypse, right? The revealing He's pulling this curtain back so that you, can, you and I can see what he's got to say. The fact that the things that he says absolutely means that these are going to come to pass. And we talked about that. Jesus was completely accurate in the things that he predicted about what was to come to the temple. Daniel was accurate. And if Jesus and Daniel are telling us these things, then you and I... You know, we should trust what he says about the rest of the future, too, including what he promised you about your eternal security in him. So, but let's read for, for and we're going to read uh, like almost the whole chapter of Mark, at least up to the point that we're in today. So for context sake, let's go back and read Mark chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. Mark 13, 1, then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And, and, and we talked about that, how some of these, you know, some of these stones weighed as much as 20 tons, you know, it was immense stones that engineering wise, we, we wonder how they moved all these things and did all these things, especially with the tools that they had at the time. Uh, the fit on many of these stones, you know, you, you can still find, you can barely slip a piece of paper in between these things. It's, it's just the engineering is incredible in how they did this. And Jesus answered him. So they're like, you know, because these guys are blown away. They can't, you know, they're like, you know, these, the, the temple, the glory of the temple. Um, is that picture still up there of the temple? Is that still in your playlist? I don't know if you deleted it or not. If you didn't, if you did, that's fine. Don't worry about it. But the temple, as you see it, you know, it was just so beautiful and it was so mind-blowing. And Jesus, you know, they're like, you know, God is obviously on our side. Look at the temple. And Jesus says, answered and said to him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, it tells us then, that's as he's leaving the temple, he tells him that, and it shut everybody up until they got to verse 3, right? Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately. So they come to him in private and say, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? So it's like, when will these things be? What are the signs coming? How do we know what's going on here? Verse 5, and Jesus answering <clears throat> them began to say, take heed that no one deceives you. This is a, a warning not just for them, but for all of us. You all need to be in a place where you are reading the scriptures, you are studying yourselves, and you are seeking God. You need to test everything I say. You know, you, you should never just believe what I say. I'm a human being. I will lie to you. It is what we do. And, and I just want to assure you, I'm not telling, you know, I'm hoping you'll, you'll trust me for the moment at least. But, you know, I, I have a propensity for it. I'm a human being, which means you need to be into this word yourself. You need to be examining yourself and seeing what God is saying in this. So Jesus, he says, take heed that no one deceives you. If, if he's saying this, that means that people will come trying to deceive you. For many will come in my name. People will come saying, I love Jesus. I love Jesus, saying all the right words, saying all the right things. They'll come in my name saying, I am he. They'll come to you saying, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And their entire modus operandi is to deceive you. And he says, 
you know, they're coming in my name saying, I am he, and will deceive many. Many will be bought into this. Many will get captured into this. But when you hear of wars and rumor of, of wars, <coughs> for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. So this is, he's saying, this is not the end. The things that he's describing right now are not the end. You know, he's telling us this. He's relaying this to us. Is not the, the end is not yet. Verse 8, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. We talked about that. That's the fact that, you know, people will rise up against one another simply because of a difference of the color of their skin or the difference of where they were born or where they were at. You know, and that's what that's talking about. And then kingdom against kingdom, it becomes a country versus country thing. That happens all the time time. It has happened throughout history. And Jesus is saying, this is going to happen. There will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. And, and, I, and I've got no problem with people always posting when an earthquake hits somewhere, when, you know, something happens. Uh, because, you know, Jesus said we should be looking for the signs. We should be looking for the things that are coming. We should be looking at these things. You know, but the fact is, is that, you know, he's saying, don't let that bother you. Don't let that affect you. That's, that's just humanity. That happens all the time. You know, so he's like, that's just the beginning of sorrows. But it's leading up to this wrath of the Lamb that we're going to see here. Because then, you know, he, he said in verses 9 through 13, let's read that. He says, but watch out for yourselves. This is still talking about before. This isn't, you know, because he's, he's telling the, the, the apostles here, you know, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, he's saying, you know, watch out for yourselves. They will deliver you up to councils. You will be beaten in the synagogues and, and, and be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. So that's one of your precursors for the signs for the end times. The gospel has to go out everywhere. And you and I know that it still is. The gospel is going out everywhere. You know, even if somebody is, is you know, wrongly representing it, the gospel still goes out. Paul said, you know, some people do it just to make money, but yet the gospel is preached. You know, so it's like people will abuse and misuse, but the fact is, you know, I mean, I, I, I was, you know, saved because uh, I heard the gospel from someone that I that I saw as authentic, and you know they taught very bad things. But the fact is, is I heard the gospel, and I wasn't saved by a person, by a religion, by a church, by anything. I was saved by Jesus Christ, and that's who you need to look to. That's why you need to be in this. And he says, you know, he, so he says, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate when you speak. Notice he's saying this to the apostles, and he's talking about a specific thing. Because I hear some people, even before they're going to go up and teach or something like that, and they're like, well, I'm not premeditating anything. I'm going to get God do it. And I'm just like, that is crazy, because he says you need to study, you know. And, and, and it's like, you know, I, I, do you want your doctor coming in and going, I didn't really need to get a refresher or anything. Let's cut that belly open. No, you want somebody that's looking into these things and doing these things for you. That this is very specific. He says, when they arrest you, when they bring you up, don't premeditate. He's talking to, the, to, to you know, these specific guys. And he says, whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. The apostles, um, even these particular guys, you know, notice when they're going to speak later on in Scripture, when they're responding to these things, it's Scripture. We see their responses to all these things that happen. You know, so that, that's one of the reasons that he's telling us this, because it's like that's the Holy Spirit speaking and telling them what's going on. Now, brother will betray brother to death. So he goes to a generality. He's not talking about their brothers and their things anymore. Now he's talking about a generality that's going to be going on, and, and it happens and still happens. You know, it happened then, and it still happens now. Um, I don't know if you ever look it up because it says brother will betray brother to death. A father is child. The children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death and you will be hated by all for my name's sake but he who endures to the end shall be saved the idea of enduring there is being is having that patience and that rest is depending upon jesus christ you may be screaming and crying and just crying oh jesus he's not saying you got to stand up and go <laughs> i could take anything for jesus it's not what he's saying he's literally saying 
you just you depend on Jesus till the end, not your circumstances, not what's going on, because sometimes Jesus is going to take you into a place where he's going to kill you. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? You know, and he says, you know, this is the thing. He's not saying that this is salvation by works. He's saying, you know, you're going to be saved. Why? Because you're going to die (laughs) and it's all going to be good. You know, we've got to get out of this idea that this life is all there is. This life is the training session for this. And, and And Matthew ended this section, verse 13, Matthew ended this section in Matthew 24, chapter 11, uh, chapter 24, verses 11 through 14. Matthew ended it this way. And, and I like what Matthew says to this, so that's what I want to read to you from Matthew. Matthew says, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And then he says, Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. That's incredible. Because we, you know, our culture, um, Christianity, many, many, many places and people in Christianity are beginning to promote lawlessness. They promote sin. They say, you know, it, it's okay to sleep around. It's okay to do this. It's okay to be homosexual. It's okay to watch pornography. It's okay to drink. It's okay. And, and, and it says all these things. We say all these things. And, and it's like, and he literally says, because lawlessness, that's sin. That's sin. He says, because sin will abound, the love of many will grow cold. I activated somebody's Siri, did I? That's what it sounded like. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, love, I love what Jesus says there, because he's like, you have to understand that just because we, you know, you know, Paul even said it in Romans. He said, you know, you know, because, you know, where grace abounds, sin much more, you know, or where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And he said, so should I sin because so I can have more grace? And he's like, certainly not. He's like, he's like, that's dumb. Okay, that's dumb. And Jesus tells us that that a, a, a people caught up in lawlessness, in the approval of sin and all these things that people caught up in that guys. That's, that's where it becomes a carnal, fleshy love, not a love of Christ. And, and here, you know, he, he says, but, and he says the same thing in verse 13 of Matthew 24. He who endures to the end shall be saved. You know, and then he says the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. The end that Jesus is talking about here, you know, it's not just talking of a kingdom, but he's talking of truth. And he says to the end, not, not through the end in this section. Notice what he says there, okay? Because now we're going to see our section today, understanding the times. And though I've got Mark chapter 13, verses 14 through 20, we're really going to be hitting verse 14 today, okay? You know, normally I teach anywhere from, you know, from six to ten verses as we're going through this. If this is your first visit to Calvary Chapel, you know, we teach chapter by chapter, verse by verse, you know, where we leave off one one week, we come back to the next, okay? So we left off with verse 13 last week, so let's look at understanding the, the times or understanding the signs, uh, part one. Uh, but let's read verses 14 through 20, just for context sake. So when you see... The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not. And then you have a parenthetical. Most of your Bibles probably have it in parentheses there. Um, Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter. For in those days there will be great tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of creation. Which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. So he says that the tribulation that's coming is is unparalleled, unequaled, before history and after history. And he says in verse 20, unless the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, and the elect that he's talking about here, he's not talking about Christians, he's talking about the Jews. And he says, but for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened 
the days. Now, you know, stop right there. This marks the sign of what Jesus is saying regarding the beginning of the end. Um, and the Holy Spirit points out to us this, this very specific thing. So since the Holy Spirit is telling us this, I just want us to understand that, you know, this is why we're spending so much time in this. This is why we're looking at this. Um, and, and the fact that this is coming, it should change us. It should change our behavior. It should break any malaise we have. It should, it should help us to make the decisions that we're going to make. You know, if God says act in love towards someone, then just act in love towards them. Why? Because he might be coming back tomorrow. You know, you don't want to be sitting there doing something dumb, like sticking something in your arm or smoking dope somewhere where you take one big inhale and before you can exhale, Jesus takes you home. Right? You don't want to be blowing that into his face or doing something like that when that happens. You want to be looking into him and saying, I, I did all I could. I did all I could. This is why Jesus says these things. He's like, you know, don't, don't have any hesitation. Just go. This is you. You know, don't, don't, have a, a, don't have the shadow of a doubt. Look, he says here in verse 14, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, where it ought not be, and then he says, let the reader understand. Now, sometimes people will teach that as a parenthetical saying, you know, let you, the reader who's reading this, understand it. But in the Greek, you know, there's no parentheses in there. Okay, so it seems to be a direction of Jesus Christ saying, when you go back and read Daniel the prophet, <coughs> you need to understand this, okay? So that's going to take us back to the book of Daniel. So if you would, hold your place here in Mark, and let's go by looking at Daniel chapter 9. So you're going to go back to Daniel. All right, Daniel. All right, it's right after Genesis, right before Matthew, right? Daniel, it's page 1045 in my Bible. I don't know where it is in yours. Some of you got like giant Bibles, so some of you got like those real thin lines. So the book of Daniel, all right? We'll do an amen thing next time we turn somewhere. So first person that, that says amen and gets there the fastest, you know. Do you ever have those? It doesn't count if you've got tabs on your Bible, though, okay? That's cheating, right? Or, or if you have electronic. Yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't flow, okay? All right. You ever used to do, I mean, because, you know, it's like uh, we used to do it with the kids. You know, you do the Bible rounds where it's like, okay, uh, who can get to this verse? And you, and you hear the pages going. It's just awesome. Uh, but you got to do it with, like, the throwaway Bibles because, like, you know, people are doing it with their leather Bibles and pages start flying out. It's not cool. Um, you know, parents get angry. Uh, <laughs> So Daniel chapter 9, you're there, and this is one of the things that I, that I really see as Jesus saying here because he's, he's being very specific, and he's saying when you see, this means it's a future thing because he's talking about something that's future. He is literally telling us this is not something that has been fulfilled up to this point, okay? So, you know, he's saying, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, but, but let's, let's focus on what Daniel says here. Look at verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, let me get there, there you go, all right, she's got, it. she's got it right so far. Daniel chapter 9, look at verse 24 with me, because the reason that he mentions this particular thing is because he's going in and talking about the 70 weeks, okay? So let's look at it, verse 24, 70 weeks now, I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but the things that he's talking about here in Daniel is he's talking about the weeks of years. Uh, this was a common thing that was done amongst the Jews, and when they would talk about these things, it's not talking about 70 weeks, but 70 weeks of years. Um, and he says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression. Okay, so he, he, he's saying th this... For it, the 70 weeks is going to bring an end and, and, and encapsulate all these things. And he says it's going to finish the transgression. All right, what is the transgression? Does anybody know what the transgression is? Wickedness, yeah, but what is the transgression? It's a specific thing. 
What's, the, what's ending the transgression? What was the transgression? What was the first transgression you remember in the Bible? Sin. It was the fall. It, you know, it was all Adam's fault, right? He tried to blame the, the woman, okay? And, and then she rightfully said, hey, I was tempted by the serpent, okay? But the transgression, it's a specific thing. He's talking about the transgression. To finish the transgression, how did he finish that? He's going to finish that on the cross. To make an end of sins. Now, sin has not been taken care of. Anybody hear sin? Okay, you can raise your hands. It's cool. It's cool. If you're not raising your hand, you're lying. You're lying, right? But it's okay. It's okay. We know. We know. It's all good, right? So this end of sins hasn't come yet. God hasn't finished his things. He says to make reconciliation for iniquity. Remember we talked about that. God has reconciled us to himself and what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Isn't that so awesome? You know, it, he's the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation, it means literally that his sacrifice was sufficient to cover the sins of all mankind for all time, past, present, and future. That's amazing. Because he said that, because that happens, and because he said these things, guys, you have this. You have it. This is yours. And he says, you know, he, he make a reconciliation for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness. Not my righteousness. My righteousness lasts five minutes at the most, right? You know, my righteousness is as filthy rags and riches, the Bible says. But his righteousness is everlasting. And he has promised that that would be your covering. To seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy his people have already rejected him. He's coming into Jerusalem. As he's saying this, he's looking at this place and he's understanding, they're going to kill me. They're about to kill me. And he is looking at this temple and he, is, and, and he knows that this is him. And his anointing is that millennial reign of that Messiah, the King that is to come. You know, in Jesus, we have all these things. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. For us to rest in him is for us to experience already right now, you and I. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus, you know, he, he talked about him fulfilling these things. He said, don't think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of these things. Now, Look at verse 25 of Daniel 9, because he says, Know therefore and understand. And remember what Jesus told us in, in, in Mark? He said, Daniel is a prophet. So Jesus believes that. And if Jesus believes that, I'm going to believe that too. And Daniel says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build, and re, and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince... So you get specific there. He says, so now he's talking about Messiah, the prince. Messiah is the anointed one, okay? So he says, there, you know, Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. with seven plus 62? I know, I don't math. That's why I'm asking. Huh? Now, you, do you get another pen? No, you can't have another pen. All right. It, it, it's, it, it's 69 weeks, right? Now... All right, for my math geeks, what's 69 times 7? A lot. All right, brilliant. All right. Huh? 487? 483? All right. I don't math, so I'm just going to take you guys' word for it. All right? Math beat me up when I was a kid, and I just never got over it, right? So, all right, all right. I see some people starting to kind of write it out. Don't do that. Let's just go, okay? All right, <laughs> 483, okay? All right, uh, the street, it says, shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times, okay? Now, um, let's read verse 26 real quick, and then I'll, I'll, we'll kind of talk about this. And he says, and after 
The 62 weeks Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, but for the people of the prince who is to come. So now he begins to talk about another prince, one that is to come, one that is not here yet. And he says the prince who is to come. So, you know, and, and notice what he's saying here. He's not saying this prince to come is destroying the city at this particular time. He literally says the people of the prince who is to come. I want you to get that because this is saying that, you know, this is not something that was done back then and fulfilled back then. This is something that for Jesus is still future. And here that Daniel's talking about, he's talking about a future. Because he says the people of the prince who is to come, that's the Antichrist as we often call him, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, the end of it shall be with a flood. This is talking about um, um, AD 70 when the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed. And the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. All right. So now this is the crazy and cool thing about it, you know, and it's like, um, you know, most people think, you know, most scholars that look into it, and there's some debate back and forth, anywhere from 3 to 5 B.C., uh, Jesus was born, okay? Because when they in- did the initial calculations and came up with year zero back in the day, it was because people kind of math like me, all right, and messed it all up, all right? So I just, I, I want you to get that. We, we, most scholars agree that Jesus was born about 5 B.C., Herod the Great was still living at the time, and he died in March 4th, uh, uh, March of 4 B.C., okay? So, and if Jesus died at the age of 33, that would take us to about A.D. 27 or 28. And guess, you know, because we read verse 25 and 26, and guess how many years that is from 445 B.C.? 483 years. Some people have even calculated the fact that Jesus Christ, the moment that he came into Jerusalem on the back of the donkey, was 483 years to the day. You have to understand, you know, when, you know, the the prophecies of Daniel, when Alexander the Great came into Jerusalem, the, the priests walked out to him from the temple with the scriptures and said, the city is yours. God said you were coming. And Alexander actually preserved the Jewish religion at that time. Did you know that? That's why we got the, you know, that, that's why we got the Septuagint, because Alexander said, this Bible needs to be in Greek, and everybody in Greece should know it, because it predicted him. All right? That's, that's what kings do, you know. So when he says this happens, you know, this 483 years after the decree was given, Jesus Christ walks in and says, Messiah who is to come is here. And he's going to take care of everything all the way up to this point. But the fact is, is we're still missing a week because that was 69 weeks that he talked about right there, right? Rome came in 70 A.D. like a flood, and the legions, which most people think, because the legions weren't just made up of just Romans. It wasn't just Italians that came in. There were Germanic tribes. There were um, Seleucids. There, you know, it was most of Europe made up these, the four legions of Rome uh, that came in and destroyed Jerusalem. And man, they, they, if uh, I just, uh, if I could put up a picture and I could just show you the things that were torn down. Um, we had talked about how 15,000 people could fit into the court of, the, of women alone in the temple area. And in that main temple area that was part of the temple mount, um, the, the legion, after destroying an entire side of the wall, came through uh, uh, fighting the Jewish rebellion. Um, and, you know, and, and it's just, it's, it's terrifying what happened. Uh, some... Romans, Roman historians say that uh, it was over 600,000 people that were killed. Uh, uh, there's some Jewish historians from the time that say there was over a million people killed. It was Passover time in 70 AD when Rome came through like a flood and destroyed Jerusalem. It says in verse 27 of Daniel chapter 9, Then he... 
and remember that this he is the prince who is to come, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. There's our missing week. There's that 70th week. But it doesn't tell us when this will happen. It doesn't say, you know, this happens immediately or five minutes later. It just says this will happen. And then it says, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. And we'll talk about this wording here in just a minute. Even until the consummation, which is determined to pour, is poured out on the desolate. This is the battle with the prince to come, but this is also the fact of him saying what's going to come in, what's going to happen is described. Look at uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. This desolation and what makes desolate is described a, a little bit better here in Daniel eleven thirty one 31, because it talks about the forces shall be mustered by him. They shall defy the sanctuary and the fortress. They shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Now, the same desolation and abominations that are mentioned earlier, that word translated abomination here is shikuts in the Hebrew. Uh, it appears 29 times in the Old Testament, <coughs> but it has the idea of something that is filthy, disgusting, monstrous. It's, it's more than just an idol. Um, you know, and if you looked at what happened, because some people look at this, <coughs> excuse me, some people look at this and they say, hey, this is talking about when Antiochus Epiphanes comes um, in, uh, I think it's 167 or something like that. Um, when Antiochus Epiphany comes in, because he actually takes over Jerusalem, he doesn't completely destroy the temple then, but when he comes in, he literally takes all the high priests and the priests of the temple and fries them. He fries them. I mean, like, puts out a big metal grate and he fries them in, 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 the, in the holy place. Uh, and after he does that, then because he was told he looked just like Zeus, he sets up a statue of Zeus and slaughters a pig for it in, in the temple. But it was restored. It was made done. You know, um, this is not talking about that. This is not what this is saying here. Um, you know, and the fact is, is that the wording here used in Daniel, he says, this is so monstrous, this is so disgusting, that the temple can't be used anymore. So what's going to happen that Daniel's talking about goes even beyond that. And if that was so horrible, you, you, you know, you, we don't even want to imagine or kind of come up with it. Um, look at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verses 9 through 13 because you know he's saying until these things are you know fulfilled until these times come these words are sealed they can't be changed they can't be moved go your way daniel verse 9 daniel 12 for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. What did Jesus just tell his guys? Let the reader understand. Let the reader of Daniel understand what's going on here, and Jesus is saying, this is part of who I am. This is part of what's going on with me. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is shut up, there shall be 1,290 days. That's about three and a half years. So Daniel is he's being, he's getting specific now. You know, just like he had said, in the middle of that week is when the guy would do these things. So he's saying there's, there's you know, it's about three and a half years. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. That's just over three and a half years. And he says, but you, you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of days. And notice an inheritance is not something that you secure or do. I can't secure an inheritance. 
I can secure an inheritance for someone else. And see, that inheritance has been secured for you in what Jesus Christ has done and what your God has done. And Daniel just prophesied and said, you could depend on it. Jesus says, let the reader understand when you go back and look at Daniel, what I have done for you. Now you could turn back to Mark. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, okay, this is all future. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4, if you go and you read the book of Thessalonians, I've actually gotten into this with a few people, and it's like, you know, um, we're going to go into a whole lot more detail about like um, um, pre, mid, and post tribulational rapture and things like that. Uh, we're going to be looking at that a lot more detail. But if you read the book of Thessalonians, over and over again, it looks like that the Thessalonians are freaked out. They're thinking they missed it. They're going, hey, Paul, what's up? You know, we got left. We got skipped. What's happening? You know, because they were being punished and it was, the tribulation was so bad. And Paul, he assures them over and over and over again, we're looking for Christ. We're looking for Christ. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Christ. And he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, he says, Let no one deceive you by any means. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. He's like, if you were really in the tribulation, you'd know who the Antichrist was, but you don't. Okay, that's what he's reading here. He says, Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, Paul is pointing and telling us this is one of the things that Jesus Christ is talking about. When he says the abomination that makes desolate, that literally means he comes and he places himself as God in the temple and the people begin to make sacrifices to him. This is why you and I have to understand you know, because as believers, we all think we're like, yeah, temple, yeah, temple. It's like, man, that's, that's huge, okay? Because the temple, uh, e even in the economy of God in the scriptures, is useless anymore. Jesus Christ came. That one sacrifice was made. That lamb is done, brothers and sisters. The temple, you know, is, is to make sacrifice. That's all it's there for. To make sacrifice for sin, but Jesus has washed our, our sins away. So look at verse 14 again of Mark chapter 13. Because what he's talking about here, this is all leading up to this, to the entire planet. Not just Jerusalem. He's being very specific here when he tells the people to run. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the, Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, he says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Normally, if you, you know, if you were, if somebody was attacking, you would run to the walled city. But Jesus says, get out of the city. It's going to be bad. And he says, let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. It's, it's, you know, we always, you know, the women run for usually like the photo books, right? You know, save the photo books, save the baby stuff, save this. The guys will say, you know, save my gun, save my computer, save, you know, sometimes a dog, right? But normally, you know, but Jesus says you don't go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of your house. He's like literally, he's like, he's like, friend, run. When this happens, you guys... You have to teach people to run. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. He's like, if you're dirty and stinky, run. Don't, don't hold back. And, and then Jesus, you know, he uses the word woe here, and it's one of compassion. And Jesus is like almost crying. He's like, you know, I, I, I hurt. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. You have to understand he's talking about Israel here. He's talking about the people of Jerusalem. He's talking about those that don't believe. 
And he's like, the cost of innocence. And you and I know, I mean, natural disasters, things strike. And we're always like, you know, but there were babies on board. There were children there. How could God let that happen? And Jesus is like, I wish it didn't have to. Whoa, whoa, man, it hurts him. And he says, and pray. And he's like, pray, man, you should pray that the fight's not in winter. Pray that this doesn't come when it's cold. How much harder is it to do everything when it's cold? Now, some of you, you like the cold, okay? But this cold is biting. This cold is hard. Imagine if it was wet and you didn't have, you know, this is, you know, and he says, for in those days, there will be tribulation such has not been since the beginning of creation. What did we just talk about? We just talked about these things, you know. The, if you were to go back to Antiochus Epiphanes, one of the things that they did after they came in and they did all these things, um, uh, the Romans would actually, if they caught somebody circumcising their child, because they were trying to stamp out the Jews, the Jewish religion. And if they caught someone circumcising their child, they would kill the child and then hang it around the mother's neck. And she had to go around wearing it as a testimony to the other mothers. Don't circumcise your child. That's a pretty horrible stuff. I can describe more to you, but I'm not going to. I think that's enough. When, so when he says what's coming, there's nothing that compares to it. The horrors that have been done by men against men is unfathomable to us. And Jesus says it doesn't compare with what's coming. And he says, he says, since the beginning of creation, he's like, even the flood, this is worse. And he says, nor ever shall be. That tells you that this is the tribulation. This is the wrath of God. You know, it's often, sometimes, some people call it the wrath of the Lamb. Jesus, you know, he promises. He says, you know, when he came, he just came to save. But he will return for judgment. That is said over and over and over again in the scriptures. And that's what this is. And he literally says, unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. None. And he says, but for the elect's sake whom he chose, because he's got to fulfill these scriptures. He's got to fulfill these prophecies that he's done. And he says, because of that, he shortened those days. So what is the abomination of desolation? Um, You know, what do those days look like? Uh, How long will, will, how long do you think the last temple will be in operation before all this goes down? You ever wonder that? Who is the dark prince, the Bible calls him? This antichrist that we often know him by, that's the most popular term. Should we Christians even celebrate the temple? Should you donate money for the temple objects? We'll talk about that next time in detail as we revisit this section of Scripture and the next section of Scripture and look at the end of it all. And again, you know, Guys, I I know this is a heavy section of scriptures, but this is where we're at, and I'm not going to skip over it, and I'm not going to make it pretty, because it's not pretty. Jesus is like, this this hurts. It hurts him. Okay? And so I just, I want you to be assured. I don't say these things to make you go, oh, yeah, I don't really want to eat lunch now. You know, that's not when I'm out. Okay? Because you know You need to read this and rejoice because your Savior draws near. You need to read this and rejoice because you know His Spirit dwells in you and His Spirit dwelling in me means I can save people from this. Why do you think He says that some people are saved as if from fire? Because this is coming. Man, jerk them out, you know? If, if you saw somebody burning in a building, you wouldn't go, hey, I don't want to offend you, but there's a door right in front of you, and if you just walk forward five feet, you'll be good, you know? You don't say that. You say, get out. Come out. Let me get you out of there, you know? 
Uh, I've seen people, and if you've ever done any kind of rescue training or anything like that, sometimes they teach you, uh, sometimes your worst enemy is the person you're trying to save. And you just need to know that. They're not angry at you. They're, they're angry at this world, the flesh, and the devil, which is out to get them. You know? But sometimes you're right in front of them, and you become a target. But just walk in his grace, walk in his mercy. You know, we're going to see the rest of this, and, 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 and it, it's heavy, but we're going to look at things in detail and, and see that, you know, the Antichrist, where he possibly comes from. Uh, no, it's not Trump. No, it's not Obama. No, it's not any of those guys. It's, 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 we'll get into it next time. Let's, um, and just remember, okay, that... Um, you know, we're going to go back and we're going to do communion in the back. So even if you don't want to stay for the meal, come back to the back, take communion with us. And, you know, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you'd like to do that, I invite you to do it. If you're not a believer and what you've heard today, you realize the accuracy of prophecy and how that verifies, you know, not just what Jesus says and what Daniel says, but it helps you to know that what this says is true. And in reading that, you can know, you can know right now that if Jesus said, if you believe in him, you know, he who believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's everlasting, guys. That's forever. And if you believe in him, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that word that he uses there, the tense of it is past tense. He's like, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're saved. Because of what he's done for you. Yeah, and, and I'd encourage you, if you'd like to give your heart to him today, to do that. To just do it. To call him into your heart. To say, Lord, I want to go back now and partake of this thing called communion. We'll explain a little more back there. Um, but, but for now, I'd like you to pray. Pray with me. Father, we come before you, Jesus, and we just thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, that brings us a, a mighty assurance, Lord, that helps us to know that when, when the word says that our God saves, we can have absolute faith that he does. We thank you, Jesus, for your, for your sacrifice on the cross, Lord. We thank you that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And in rising from the dead, it proved to us everything, Lord, everything. We thank you for the testimony of, of all of your apostles, your disciples, of, of everything that we see because it's led up to this moment where we can become believers in Jesus Christ, where we can walk in faith towards you and know and understand that our eternity is secure in you. Lord, if there's anyone here today that hasn't given their lives to you, I pray that they would today, that, Lord, that they would accept you as their Lord and Savior, that they would truly understand and believe that they could see now just the, the the few things that point to the accuracy of the scriptures means that what we have is eyewitness testimony that Jesus rose again from the dead and was taken up from the Mount of Olives, the same mount that he's doing this from. And we can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that our salvation is secure in him. And Lord Jesus, I just pray right now, Father, um, bless the meal that we're about to have. Bless the communion that we're about to partake of. And, and I just thank you, Lord. I, I thank you for just being able to fellowship with, um, with, with the great people that you've brought in and, and that you're bringing in. We pray for those that are struggling and having a hard time. And we just lift it all up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So if you would, before everybody just breaks, um, stand up. Those of you that have kids, go back and get your children. Okay. Uh, because, you know, we'll all, then we'll all go back and we'll take our seats or we'll stand around and do what we need to do. So go get your kids. All right. And, uh, but right now we've got somebody that's, uh, huh? Who did what? Oh, no, no. Yeah. I'm not praying for him. Um, we have a couple. Okay. You guys want to stand up? Are you okay with it? You don't want to stand up? Huh? All right. Okay. All right. Tell, tell, tell everybody your name because I'm not going to mess it up. I'm John Evanook. This is my wife, David. See, Evanook. If I was going to say a boniac again because I keep messing with it. All right. So Taylor and John, this is their last Sunday with us. 
Sad days, sad days. So, you know, if, if you guys hang and you're with us, uh, you know, we love you guys from, um, from the base. But, I mean, we love everybody. Um, but usually with the guys from the base, we have an opportunity to pray for them before they go. So, as a prayer towards you, let's sing our song to them, okay? All right? You guys ready? Let's put it up. You got it ready, Lisa? All right. So, everybody stand up now that you know. And John and Taylor, and we're going to sing this song to them. Okay. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. His countenance upon thee and give thee peace. All right. Now, all the kids should be done in the back. You guys go find your seats. Um, we, and uh, we just need to separate the kids' tables back there. But, and, 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 you know, and even if you just come back and join us for communion, that's cool. All right. If you're 